And welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp, and I'm the Executive Editor of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining today's installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, Real World Data Governance, with Bob Siner. Today we'll be discussing good data governance to great data governance. Just a little points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions on Twitter using RWDG. That's Real World Data Governance. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Bob Siner. Bob is the President and Principal of KIK Consulting and Educational Services and is the publisher of the Data Administration newsletter, tdan.com. Bob has been a recipient of the Damon Professional Award for significant and demonstrable contributions to the data management industry, and Bob specializes in non-invasive data governance, data stewardship, and metadata management solutions. And with that, I will give the floor to Bob to introduce the webinar. Hello, welcome. Thank you very much, Shannon. Just doing a quick sound check. Can you hear me okay? Okay, okay. just making sure I didn't respond there right away. Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning to some of you, or good evening to some of you, I guess. Thank you, as always, for taking time out of your busy schedule to participate in the Real World Data Governance webinar series. I've really been looking forward to giving this webinar ever since I gave the presentation of good data governance to data governance at a data diversity conference at, earlier this year at Enterprise Data World, and the reception of the um, of the subject was quite interesting. I thought um, first thing to do before I get started here, just by show of hands, everybody raise their hand if uh, you've heard of the book Good to Great. I, I thought I thought most of you would have heard of Good to Great before. And also, a yeah, show of hands. How many of you heard me at Enterprise Data World in San Diego? Ah, good. At least a couple of you have uh, have seen the session before. But um, it's a book that's been a favorite of mine. It's been out for quite a long time. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the book at the beginning. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to borrow from some of the main chapters that Jim Collins talked about in the book and relate it to data governance and, and specifically good data governance to great data governance. And I actually think that the tab that goes with the book, why some companies make the leap and some do not, is especially pertinent to this subject. Because some organizations put guns in place and they, they feel as though they're getting a few things done, but they never really strive to be great data governance. I know if you've had an opportunity to, uh, to, to read through some of the presentations made by some of the Data Governance Best Practice Award winners over the past several years, these are organizations that have taken a specific, uh, have taken a specific path to putting date, great data governance within their organization. So if you're not familiar with the book, uh, sit back. I'll tell you a little bit more about it. Um, if you are familiar with it, I'd be curious as to what your thoughts are as to how I relate the sort of data governance to the book, Good to Great. So before I start, I just want to again run through what some of the webinars that are coming up in the next couple of months. The next one should be quite interesting as well. There's been a lot of call for a webinar like this one, Governing Customer Data, and Is There a Difference? And I think some people will say, yes, there's a difference between governing customer data and others, and some people will say, no, it's just data, and we just need to govern it. So I won't tell you what my thoughts are until next month. Then managing governance metadata for mass consumption, governing data, big data and small data, come one, come all, and then talk about managing data governance expectations in the December webinar in this series. So I want to spend a moment here talking about the book before I jump into it. A dozen years ago, okay, so back in 2001, Jim Collins put out a book called Good to Great through Harper Business. And it was, as they said here, is the first book that really stretched far beyond the traditional business book uh, audience and market. It stretched into technical people and non-technical people alike. I just looked this up on the uh, the internet the other day, and the book Good to Great by Jim Collins, even though it was written in 2001, is still the 20th bestseller on the business bestseller list, so you can go check that out. But the book is readily available, and I can't tell you how many times I've seen it. My clients' uh, organizations have had this book, so I highly recommend it. Find a light read, but also uh, very relevant to what we're going to talk about today. So in this, book, in this webinar, I'm going to borrow from main points of the book. I'm going to demonstrate how organizations have hit that glass ceiling 
where they haven't really been able to go beyond being a good program to a great program. Uh, if you're not familiar with what the cover of the book looks like, uh, it's on this slide right here. All of the pertinent information that you need to go and track it down. Uh, again, I find it to be a great book and, and something that you, you might be interested in reading if you haven't had a chance to look at it yet. So he also wrote the book, uh, Built to Last, The Management Studies of the 90s. Boy, the 90s seems so long ago, doesn't it? Um, to prove of the current uh, management hype of the superhuman CEOs, you'll be able to tell that through some of the things that I talk about here. Do not enable mediocrity to be become uh, competent. Enable competence to become excellence. And those are the things that are just written on the outside of the cover of the book. So I think there's a lot of good stuff on the inside of the book, which we're going to talk to. Um, and in fact, what I did for this webinar, since it's kind of an abbreviated presentation of the good to great presentation I gave back at EDW. I had almost three hours for that, and I have about an hour for this, or maybe a little bit less, so that we can take questions. I'm going to focus on the, these five chapters of the book, and I think they're very early chapters, if they are not the first five. They're, they're five of the first chapters of the book. We're going to talk about good becoming the enemy of great, and I think I think that's one of Jim Collins' favorite sayings, and he says it throughout the book. We'll talk about level five leadership. First, the who, then the what. Confronting brutal facts, yet never losing the faith. And I know a lot of organizations, when it comes to putting governance programs in place, have to keep that faith for some time just to make sure that it's understood and that people um, people get the idea that governance is not this huge challenge everybody makes it out to be. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through this as well. And then we'll talk about a culture of discipline. If you remember, uh, I may have talked about this before, there's an article that I wrote back in the TDAN publication many moons ago called The Three Ds of Data Stewardship. And it was database, discipline, and de facto. So talking about discipline as being one of the key pieces of putting a governance program into place and formalizing people's behavior. Again, we'll talk more about that as we go forward in the slide deck. Um, what I do with all the webinars, uh, since I, I don't know how many of you are brand new to this webinar series, and I'm assuming that some are, but some may have been here um, times in the past, or hopefully many times in the past, I want to share my definitions that I use for non-invasive data governance. So just part of give me a minute here just to kind of walk through those real quickly with you. Um, data governance to me is the execution and enforcement of authority over the management of data and data-related resources. And I know you've probably heard me say that before, but when I talk about things in terms of non-invasive data governance, but then I find governance as being about execution and enforcement of authority, well, the fact is non-invasive kind of describes the way that we can put governance into place. But the definition of data governance is that we need to be able to execute and enforce on authority for the management of data in our organizations in order to truly govern the data. So we try to do it in a non-invasive way if we can do that, if it fits the culture of our organization. Otherwise, um, we do need to execute and enforce authority. We need to have the right people making the right decisions at the right time and all of those things that uh, you hear people talk about the different bills of rights in regards to data governance. Um, data stewardship, if you know, uh, if you've heard me speak before, you know that talk about the fact that almost anybody in the organization could be a steward of data. All we're really doing is formalizing the accountability over the management of data and data related to resources. So I'm, I'm certainly one to tell you don't need to go out and tag each person specifically as a data steward and tell them to do data steward stuff. The fact that they have a relationship with the data, whether it's defining data or producing data or using data as part of their job, there's going to be a level of formal accountability around the the way that they manage the data, and that's really what non-invasive data governance is all about. The definition of non-invasive data governance, before we jump into the book here, is it is the practice of applying formal accountability and behavior through non-invasive roles and responsibilities, and I'll share some of those with you through this session as well, um, to existing and or new processes to assure that that the definition, production, and usage assures those things that you see, regulatory compliance, security, privacy, protection, quality, all the great things that we want to expect out of our data. We want to do it in such a way where we don't make people feel as though it's over and above what they're presently doing. It's just a more formal way of getting things done and thus becoming more efficient and more effective in what we do around the management of the data assets in our organization. That's all I want you to take from this session. Well, it's kind of a light-hearted session, but I do plan to um, address 
those things I talked about in relationship to the book. I want you to, to get an idea that this book may be a good read for you, but also some ideas as to what it might take to take your organization from being good in data governance to becoming great in data governance. Help you to think of some of the things that you might need to put in place so you can plan to be great, and then talk about some pragmatic disciplines and share with you some tools and templates that I've uh, I've shown some of them in the past in previous webinars, but I want to show them again in the context of what we're talking about here in this specific webinar. I started talking about good data to great data. Uh, we've got to understand, well, whose definition of good are we using? And whose definition of great are we going to use? Well, in my opinion, when we're talking about traits of great data, of great data governance, they basically follow these specific four traits. And I think they make sense for most, most organizations that, it's, number one, it satisfies the business need. And some one of the things that I'll talk about a little bit later in this webinar is if we can get the business to tell us the need that data governance is going to address rather than us tell them the need that data governance is going to address, that's a big win for us. If we can get the business people to tell us where governance is going to add value for them, and then we can take that to the management. It's not us. Again, just evangelizing on the need for data governance, it's basically saying we are going to address these specific needs that are coming from the business areas of our organization. Um, how we Another trait of good versus great is view it as an investment versus an expense. A lot of organizations think about, well, how much is it going to cost for us to put a governance program in place? And I've spoken about it before. Where I don't think you're going to buy a, a software solution and implement it and therefore have a data governance program. Typically, uh, if we're looking at it as an, invest, as an investment in time and resources because typically data governance costs really what we put into as far as time and effort. We're not going to buy a software solution and implement it. It may help us to um, to, to be to enable our data governance program, but just by implementing the software, it does not put a governance program in place, especially if we're looking at executing and enforcing authority over the management of data, which typically can't be done through a piece of software. Uh, formalizing on formality, efficiency, and effectiveness, focusing on quality, those are the traits of things that are great in our organization. If we satisfy the business, if we view it as an investment, we become more formal and we focus on improving quality in whatever we do, those are the four traits that I want to share with you in regards to what would make a great data governance versus just a good data governance program. And I want to share with you a line that I may have shared in the past which came from a client year ago who said, don't let perfection get in the way of good enough. So when we're putting a governance program in place, let's make certain that we can evolve over time and that we don't think that it has to be perfect right out of the gate. The idea is that we learn by doing, and if we can learn by doing it and we can improve things, make the little things that are good, turn those little things into great things rather than trying to think that we can be great right out of the gate. Because in most organizations, it is exactly what I said. It's an evolution. It's not a revolution. And it's something that is done incrementally in most organizations. What I want to talk about is planning to be great. And I just thought I would share this slide with you real quickly. Um, the little guy here in the picture is certainly planning to be great with the helm. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about planning to be great within our organizations. So what are some of the things that we need to do to emphasize uh, planning uh, for data governance in our organizations? Well, one of the things that organizations do is they set up an information policy or a data governance policy or a, a data quality policy or something to that extent that basically gets the sign off from the people at the level of the organization that say, yes, this is important. We realize that we need to be certain that we follow the rules associated with these guidelines associated with our data. So, for example, data could be managed as a corporate asset. We need to formalize accountability for the management of that data that we we need to be consistent in the way that we manage data across the organization. All of those things are typically written into an information policy. Stewardship is applied accountability. I talked about that a little bit before. You know, the whole idea of not necessarily having to go out and assign people to be data stewards, we should be able to recognize who those people are that are working with the data and, again, formalize their accountability, apply their accountability to existing processes and things that we have going on with our organization rather than than trying to sell this as being a governance process, which is going to change what we do. Now, we don't really need to do that. 
I mean, there are situations in your organization where that becomes important. But for most of the time, what we want to do is we want to apply governance to the existing processes, get the right people involved in the right time to do the right thing, to make the right decision, at least most of the time. So oh, we want involve enterprise data. Uh, in most organizations, they they, they view governance as something that's going to touch on all of their enterprise data, but then oftentimes they focus initially on that core data that is associated with key performance indicators, performance metrics, and those types of things um, within an organization. So we realize that we need to put a program in place. We need to plan a program that will touch on enterprise data, but we need to specifically focus on specific core data. Again, if we're going to do this incrementally within our organization, we want to concentrate on quality and how we're going to measure the success of governing the data, and we're going to make sure that metadata becomes something that's front and center to data governance. I talked about in a previous webinar the relationship between data governance and metadata, which is metadata is certainly a byproduct of your data governance program. We need to have a plan as to how we're going to manage that metadata that comes out through some of these tools and templates I'm going to show you in a minute. But we also want to make sure that we govern the metadata as we are identifying the specific metadata that's going to be valuable to our organization. So the other thing about is money solution versus practice and discipline solutions. My suggestion typically is to, to go with the practice and the discipline solution rather than trying to trying to throw money at putting your governance program over the, the hill from being a good to being a great data governance company. All right, we're going to talk about these five different chapters. As I mentioned before, good is the enemy of great, level five, first two, then, then what? Confer brutal facts and a culture of discipline. Before I wanted to share with you a word on data management, just take a quick minute. Uh, if we don't throw some comic relief into these things, uh, they become somewhat dry. But I just thought this was a great example of a Dilbert on data management. If you have any accurate numbers, so you just made up a number for a report. Studies show that numbers aren't more useful. They're, they're more useful when you make them up, and then he's up a number 87 study. So just thought that was kind of uh, humorous for you. Let's talk about how good became the enemy of great. Challenge basically one of the things that Jim Collins talks about significantly in the book is the reasons that there's so few organizations that become great is because they settle on being good not always looking for ways to improve. And I know in years gone by, continuous improvement was always a big thing in a lot of manufacturing companies. A lot of other organizations have also started to latch onto that again, where they're looking for continuous improvement. Well, you want to take your program. You don't want to be satisfied when you've got a win or two or three. The idea is to build governance into what people do in their daily jobs, so they don't even recognize it as being governance. So we need to settle on the good, we need to, to aspire for becoming great. And so the things that we need to ask ourselves, or a couple of the things that we need to ask ourselves are, do we have a good program? Is it satisfying the business need? Or are things that we can be doing, maybe even reaching out to the business part of the community, asking them, what can we be doing for you? Okay, we've put governance in place. Are there things that we could be doing right now that go over and above the things that we're presently doing for you to surely meet your business need greater than we're, be, uh, we're meeting it right now? Are you satisfied with the good or is it important to get to great? I mean, some organizations, the people that have responsibility for their day governance programs seem to be able to make a name for themselves within their organizations because they are having that level of impact on the organization. So if you're looking at data governance to be something that's going to help to drive your career, and I know there's a lot of you out there that that's probably that's probably the case, is that governance could become your ticket to moving even moving up within the organization. Well, you don't really want to settle on just being good. You want to keep looking for ways to improve. So what's the difference between a good program and a great program? The great program is the one that's always looking for ways to improve. It's that old continue to improve moniker that was used you know, many years ago, um, my suggestion is go to the business people within your organization and get them to tell you where are seeing value from your existing governance, but then if they can also share with you what can take you to the next level, that's worth its weight in gold to your organization. And what it take to move from good to great? Sometimes it takes additional resources. Sometimes it takes additional focus or additional 
organization. But the fact is we need to look at these things. We need to recognize what's holding us back from becoming even greater than what we're presently doing and then start to address some of those issues head on as we move from being a good a good in data governance to becoming great in data governance. So uh, colleagues in this chapter of uh, how the good became the enemy of great talked about four phases of going from good to great. The search, comparing it to what, inside the black box, and chaos, the concept. What I want to do is kind of walk through each of those real quickly with you. So phase one is the search. Well, what is it that we're searching for? We're putting governance in place within our organization. So what we're looking for is some level of targeted behavior, whether it's formalized behavior or just getting the right people at the right time to become involved in initiatives. What we're searching for is typically that target behavior and tell what the end game is. And what, So typically in an organization, when you put a governance program in place, there's no ultimate end game. You get to the end where you've won and everybody cheers and throws their arms around you. you know, the fact is, when you think about um, the fact that I think I shared this story before where a CFO asked me, how many stewards are we going to need and how long are we going to need them for? Well, if you can kind of reverse that question back to them and say, um, how long do you have to have quality data for? How long do you have to be uh, compliant? How long do you have to listen to the regulators? The truth is that there's no end to that. So we always want to improve the quality of data. We always want to have formal accountability for the data. So the targeted behavior is just kind of to build that in to what we do in our organizations. And if you get to the point where data governance becomes second nature to your organization, I said you kind of won the game. So if you're, if you're doing that search, what are we searching for as an organization? Looking for that targeted behavior, and we're looking to make it part of what people do on a day-to-day -day basis. So we're beginning to begin by defining best practices for our organization, make it practical and dual, make sure that the, the organization, so when you define a best practice, the two criteria that I use is, is, is it practical and doable and will it add value and will we be at risk if we don't achieve that best practice? So I think in a, a webinar that I have coming up, we'll be talking about that in some more detail. But when you define your best practices around data governance for your organization, you've got to make sure that they're, they're practical and doable and they add value and they'll be at risk if you don't achieve that best practice. Second phase that Jim Collins talked about was comparing to what. So once we've identified these best practices, the first thing that we need to do as an organization is say, where do we stand in comparison to those best practices? What is we can leverage that we're presently doing, but where are there opportunities to improve as well? As you move forward with your, your governance program, you want to make sure that you're addressing those opportunities, those gaps between what you're presently doing and what you say you want to do with your best practice. And then come to some recommendations when you get done with it, and then develop an action plan that becomes so important to most organizations. Now, the interesting thing is, with a lot of organizations, they can kind of take this two-pronged approach. One of the prongs is, let's continue to just, just define the program, define the roles, uh, onboard people, uh, provide um, orientation of the program to these individuals, while at the same time, let's start tackling some important issues that we have within our organization. So there's kind of two prongs going on simultaneously. There's the let's, let's act now, let's start to govern data now. And the other prong is let's get our ducks in a row. Let's make sure that we have the practices defined, that we have our communication plan and our action plan defined. All the communications plan that we talk about often is, which is vital to the success of a governance uh, governance program. The third phase of the chapter, how, how good organizations become uh, how good becomes the enemy of great basically is that black box you know what does it take to make the leap to go from being a good company to a great company what are the messages that we need to share with our management again one of the things that, that you've probably heard me say before is that government uh, that the organization management portion of your governance program is going to be whatever you give to them so if you give them the perception that governance is a great challenge, that it's huge, it's complicated, it's going to cost lots of money, that it's going to get in the way of initiatives and things like that, that's what they're going to believe. But if you change your message that you should give to your management, you say, you know what, we're already doing governance to a certain aspect. We have people within the organization that have responsibilities associated with the data. 
and we need to just formalize what they do, when they do it, how they do it, and those types of things. It doesn't it necessarily need to sound easy, but we can tell them that if we just put some time into this and we formalize accountabilities rather than throwing a whole lot of dollars at it, that we can be very successful and we can move our program from just being good to be great, to being able to exceed the expectations that are set out for us by the business. Inside that black, that black box is also those best practices in critical analysis and then action plan and communication plan. All those things really need to be built um, as part of your program as you start to move forward. People want to know why you're addressing certain things the way that you are. Well, a best practice indicates that this is our behavior, but here's where what our actual behavior is. It basically demonstrates to individuals a roadmap of what you need to do to move your program from being good or being even even there at all around governance to having a governance program first before we take that program from being a good program to being a great program. So the black box, I think it's a uh, it's a great uh, pick for this, is the fact that we know that we need to create some things to make this program successful in our organization, but we're not really certain what those things are. Well, you start with best practices and you do that critical analysis. You start with an action plan and a communications plan, and you develop some of the tools and templates and things that, are, that I'm going to demonstrate with, for you in the next couple slides. I mean, those are some of the things that are kind of go into that black, black box when you're creating your, your governance initiative. That's one is, and I love this picture as well. I uh, don't know where that picture was actually taken in place or whether it was Photoshopped to look this way, but moving from chaos to concept. I don't expect that you're going to be able to flip a switch and have governance come on for your organization. That it's going to need to be incremental. We're going to need to learn by our mistakes. So we've got to move from what might be presently described as chaos within an organization to some concept and some evidence of what governance looks like within the organization. And again, as I mentioned earlier, the last bullet on this slide is extremely important. Getting the business and technical resources to tell you rather than you tell them the value that governance is going to bring to your organization. Again, if you're looking to go from good to great, instead of addressing what you think their needs are, if you can get them to articulate what their needs are and where governance will address those, you have much more likelihood of moving from being a good data governance program to a great data governance program. So that summarizes the first chapter of the book. I'm going to kind of move through some of others quickly here. Um, we've got about a half hour left to go. Uh, Jim Collins talked about level five leadership in his book, Good to Great. Let's talk about that for a second. So um, the way he described it within the book was that there were five levels of leadership. There was the executive, the effective leader, the competent manager, the contributing team member, and the highly capable individual. And I think if you get that to read the book and read what he talks about in regards to each of these different levels, you would probably immediately be able to identify people in your organization that fit into the each of these five categories. And so we'll talk about the level five in one second, but what I want to do real quickly was compare that to the pyramid diagram that I use so often in these webinars, where you've got the executive, strategic, tactical, and operational levels that kind of line up a little bit with what Jim uh, Collins talked about with his five levels. So again, you recognize that we need to build roles that are associated with the executive, strategic, tactical, operational support, and you get our understanding as to um, what kind of, of attitude is needed by each of these different levels, how much do they need to understand about governance, how they're going to participate in governance, and typically what their activities are going to be. So typically when I talk about the five levels, I talk about the, the, the fifth level being that executive level, which has limited interaction with the, the data governance program, the data governance council at the strategic level, the domain stewards, the operational data stewards, the data governance team, and the IT professionals within your organization. So similar to what, what Mr. Collins talked about with his five levels, those five levels that I typically talk about. And in some organizations, they've said, well, let's try to remove one of those levels and see if it works within our organization. Well, the fact is, you've already got operational people that are finding, producing, and using data as part of their daily job. You've got people, at least to some degree, that are subject matters of data across the enterprise. They're more at your tactical level. You've got strategic decision makers. You've got executive level um, people within the organization. They're level of understanding. 
understanding and support data governance may not be where it needs to be, but you've got all of those five levels within your organization. It's very important to recognize who fills in those roles and how can we record that information and make it valuable to us as we move our program from being a good program to a great program. So in the next chapter, I'm going to show, share with you a couple of the, the different tools and templates that you may be able to use to do that. So Jim Collins talked about level five leadership. He talked about humility and will, a compelling modesty, and unwavering resolve to do what must be done in your organization. Well, in order to go from being good at anything to being great at anything, you almost need to have that unwavering resolve to do what must be done. So if you can get your, your senior most management to understand what governance is, how it's going to be effective, um, what roles people are going to play, the fact that it's going to be non-invasive in nature in your organization, that's a big win for your organization. If you can get somebody at the senior leadership level to understand these things and to have an unwavering resolve behind what you're trying to do from a governance perspective. What I've said many times before, it, it, for most organizations, the level of support that you get from any individual business area in your, your organization it's typically going to be directly corresponding to the level of support that our senior most management has for governance. So that's why it's almost important to, across the board, get senior management, your executive level, your um, VP level, your director level, to understand the value of governance so they can get instilled that within the people who work under them within their organization. So you need that unwavering resolve to do what needs to be done. Talked about level five leadership displaying a workmanlike diligence, so being a, that plow horse rather than being a show horse, because they're not in it for show. They really are have some level of commitment to improve the levels of governance within the organization. But there's the first who, then what, which is the third chapter of the book. And in this chapter, I'll share with you a couple different templates that hopefully you can take away and uh, apply to governance in your organization. So Colin has talked about addressing who first, then what. And I, I thought this is a great quote to come from the electric cool, uh, electric Kool-Aid acid test. By Tom Wolf, he says, now, there are going to be times when we can't wait for somebody. Now, you're either on the bus or you're off the bus. The fact is, that's going to be the way that it is with, with governance in your organization. You can't sit around and wait for everybody to approve. There's levels of governance that need to be applied as you start kicking out, off and rolling out your program. So you want to make sure that you do as well as you can in communicating to people across your organization the value of governance, but we can't work for everybody. And so we have to at least address some key people, demonstrate some value to some key people, rather than trying to address the issues of the organization as a whole. I know that just from experience, I can tell you that if you try to bite off too big of the, a piece of the elephant, uh, you're going to have a really difficult time and being successful with your governance program. And I can tell you time and time again that there's been organizations that have taken small wins and, and kind of clung to that low-hanging fruit that we've described as the, the opportunities that are right out there for your taking. You know, in some organizations, it makes a lot of sense to address those first rather than trying to address the big issues that you have within your organization. Tim Collins talked about when in doubt, don't hire people, just keep looking for the right person to play a certain role. When you need to make a people change, then act. Don't be afraid to act. He talks about putting, this is very important, this third discipline of putting your best people on your biggest opportunity and not your biggest problem. A different way of thinking for most organizations. They, they typically will take their best people, put them on their biggest problems, rather than viewing what's the biggest opportunity that we have within our organization and applying those people to those um, to those opportunities. So again, not a genius with a thousand helpers. You've got the level five leadership who advise the right people to get on the bus, kind of builds that superior executive team. Once you have the right people in place, start figuring out what the best path is to greatness. And again, that's something that Jim Collins talked a great deal about in the book, Good to Great. So how does this relate to governance? Well, one of the things that we need to do, and one of the very first best practices that I've found with a lot of organizations is that we need a senior management sponsorship, support, and understanding of the data governance initiative. 
So it's one thing to sponsor. It's one thing to support. I mean, I can tell you time and time again, again, that there are people at higher levels of the organization that hear about data governance and say, I need a program like that, when they don't really understand what that really means. So the people that have the responsibility for putting governance in place or the ones that want to have the responsibility for putting governance in place need to, to basically focus on that third aspect of what senior management needs. Focus on understanding that they understand that there's issues and they understand there's already governance and they understand that we can kind of formalize accountability rather than going around with a two-by-four and hitting people over the head. Very often they'll sit forward in their chairs and, and ask you to explain to them how exactly this is going to work within their organization. So, a couple things. First, the who and then the what. So the first is the who. And I know I've shared this with uh, with you folks before in some way, shape, or form, but I'm going to actually create the background, and then I uh, actually put a, a, um, a matrix in front of the back matrix, and I call this the common data matrix. And the common data matrix is the first who part of what Jim Collins is talking about. We need to identify who in the organization knows what data and how they use that data across the organization. So I'm going to try with the here. So the first thing we want to do is we want to identify what are the domains of data or the subject areas of data. In this example here, it's customer data. It's customer address data. It's customer demographic data, financial data. It's product data, service data, accounts receivable data for the different parts of the organization, which then defined across the top. And so you know who uses what data across the organization. And there's a change to a business rule associated with the domain of data, it takes all the guesswork out of who we need to talk to and when we need to talk to them <coughs> in relationship to the change to the data. So I had this conversation with a client earlier today where we talked about doing this inventory of who does what with data. So the first thing we need to know is the who. We need to inventory what data we have, where it resides, who in the organization touches that data, whether they define it or produce it or they use it, as we mentioned earlier, there's a level of accountability that goes along with that relationship to the data. So we need to document that information somewhere. And the common data matrix becomes a great place. I know it's probably not the ideal place to, to manage that information, but at least as you're putting your arms around governance in your organization, we can identify, what, again, what are the domains of data, and then how they're being used across the organization. And that kind of addresses the first two part of what Jim Collins was talking about. So once we've identified the who, and we know who is defining and who's producing and who's using the data across the organization, the next thing that we need to address is in what? What we do, basically. So here's one of the things that I wanted to share with you, and I've shared with you something similar to this before, which is it's a list of these are some of the different activities that we will associate with data governance. And we can click on one of those and bring up a list of what the different activities are associated with that one repeat action. And in this, uh, what I call data governance activity matrix, we can take the different levels of stewards that we have across our organization and associate them to the different steps of, whether it's resolving or researching and information quality issue, identifying and monitoring risk and compliance needs, monitoring information quality, all of those things we all recognize are very relevant to governance in our organization. So once we've identified who does what with data across the organization, the next step may be that we want to associate them with the what. What do they do? So they, they get a better sense of we'll take them from, again, being good at what they do to being great at what they do. If we can formalize accountability and get people involved in the appropriate steps of a certain activity, like resolving or researching information quality issues, is that what governance is all about? Again, if we're just trying to go from being good to being great, we need to formalize people's accountability in actions that they take. Here's an example of that. Master data uh, certification process where we have the what's of the process and the who's of the organization and different roles and responsibilities, and we identify who's responsible, who's accountable, who needs to be consulted, who needs to be informed, and so on and so forth. So what we're doing is we're taking the who's that we identified in the common data matrix, and we're documenting and we're formalizing accountability 
for the different steps of the different things that we want to do within our organization. Fourth factor I'm going to talk about real quickly here is confronting the brutal facts. I talked this a little bit earlier, and I just want to go through them real quickly and to the messages that I suggest that we share with our management. We're already governing data. We can analyze how we govern data by putting structure around it. We can improve how we manage risk, how we improve quality, how we coordinate and cooperate around data. We don't have to spend a ton of money. Talk overhead with an organization that I'm working with, and we don't want to add additional overhead to what they do. We don't want to interfere with the existing activities within the organization. We don't have to spend a lot of money, but at the same time, we know we recognize that we need to put time into it. Somebody has to have the responsibility for putting the program in place. And last but not least is we need structure. And we should consider non-invasive approach because in my experience, non-invasive seems to fit to the cultures a lot of organizations these days. A couple other messages for management. And again, it goes back to our management believing what we tell them. So if we tell them that data governance is going to be a huge challenge, that it's a technical solution, that really governing data, then we're setting them down on the wrong path. And then the data governance doesn't have to be a huge challenge. It's not a technical solution. It's more of a people solution. And actually, we're not even governing the data itself. We're governing people's behavior associated with it. And we do this in an evolutionary way, not a revolutionary way, where we can build things into our organization and improve them step by step. We can take certain aspects of our program from good and focus on them and make them great rather than trying to make the entire program great. So we developed one of the things Jim Collins talked about is a climate where the truth is heard. With questions and not with answers. So if you go into the business people in your organization and you tell them that governance is the greatest thing since sliced bread and this is what it's going to do for them. Yes, that makes sense to them. Maybe they'll it'll resonate with them and they will they'll they'll believe everything you tell them. Or if you look at it from the other way around, if you look at them telling you or getting a good enough understanding so that they can tell you where governance is going to add value to them, what do you need to do? You need to lead with the questions. Don't lead with the answers. You know, engage in dialogue and debate. Conduct autopsies. I mean, recognize that previous projects took longer than they should. Issues took longer than they should, should to resolve. Identify where... Where gaps? Where where did the things fall down that took the extra time? Did we not know the appropriate people and get the appropriate people at the appropriate time? I had a client many years ago who told me that when they were working on their customer relationship management initiative, they started out with a team of five people, and then it went from five to ten to fifteen to twenty as more and more people caught wind of the fact that they were working on customer relationship management. And everybody said, "You can't do that without my being involved." And we can identify what took us so long in getting the appropriate people involved at the appropriate time. We can address that through things like the comp data matrix that I just showed earlier, where we know who does what with data across the organization. And that red flag mechanism, I have a client now who's building the name of their company at, or governance, data governance at the name of their company dot com, indicating people on the fact that if they see a red flag, there's somebody that they can reach out to and let people know, that not when they have groups, more where there are things that need to be addressed within the organization. And facts are better than dreams. So back your words with business and technical people's words, as I said before. Learn and then preach to them. Ask them the questions like, what is the quality of the data preventing you from doing? What you like to do with the data that you presently can't do? Oftentimes, when you go into a meeting with business people and you ask, these types of questions, it's like somebody turns a spigot and all of a sudden it starts pouring out. Oh, well, you know, if we had the ability to compare costs across regions or compare costs across plants, you know, we'd be able to do this. Or if we knew where our raw materials were or we knew who needed to be made aware of a certain change to a business rule that we could get right 100% of the time. You know, they're going to be the ones that can tell you where governance is going to add value to them rather than, than the other way around. So you focus by getting facts from them using their words rather than your words when you're pushing your governance program forward. Be able to where people have the tremendous opportunity to be heard. Again, give them 
in that feedback loop. It's always really important to your organization to put feedback in where people can tell you where governance is adding value, where it's not adding value, where they need it to add value, and those types of things. So build those types of feedback loops into what you do. And what I want to talk about here real quickly before we take some questions is the curve of discipline. And this was the sixth chapter of Jim Collins' book, Good to Great. Jim Collins talked about developing a culture of formal discipline. That is what data governance is all about. The fact is that he mentions developing a culture of formal discipline. Um, the fact is things are done very informally now. A lot of organizations are done inefficiently and ineffectively. And if you could just identify the appropriate people, get them engaged at the appropriate time, it's really formal. It's not different. We're not picking up the organization and dropping it on its ear and picking up all the pieces. What we're doing is taking advantage of those things that exist within our organization, and we're formalizing them. I spoke real briefly about that article many years ago, you know, Data Stewardship in 3D, where it's about de facto, the fact that there's already people in the organization that are stewards. We need to identify who they are. Are. There's a discipline aspect that we're talking about here. There's the database or the common data matrix or the steward repository or whatever tool you use to collect the information about who the stewards of data are and engaging the appropriate stewards at the appropriate time. And then there's an article that's going to be coming out in, uh, in TDAN in a, uh, the next month called the Data Governance Bill of Rights. It talks all about getting the right people to do the right thing at the right time, giving the right information with the right decision making, which leads to the right result most often. Isn't, it, isn't that, again, what governance is all about? It's getting the right people involved at the right time to do the right thing. And if you do that, you can go from being just a good organization when it comes to governance to be that, that higher end uh, organization, that, 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 that great organization around data governance. So, again, the Bill of Rights and the artifacts that go with them. There's getting the right person by using the common data matrix at the right time, using that activity matrix that I shared with you, giving the right information. That's the data governance metadata, the decision flows, policy, all of those types of things. But really what governance is all about. And if you build that culture of discipline into your organization and people start recognizing it as second to what they do, then you can truly say that you've won this data governance game if you consider data governance to be a game. As Jim Collins mentioned, build a culture. Don't be a tyrant. That data governance is not optional, and we're going to come around and club you over the head with a stick and tell you what to do. Take a take a different approach with people. Tell them you know, you're already doing governance. There's ways that we can govern better. Stay in those results, depending on building a culture of uh, of self discipline where people themselves take the initiative that they talked about in the level five um, executive. They say, this is something that's very important. I'm taking my job very seriously. When I see a data governance issue, I contact the data governance team, or I, I personally take some initiative to get, to get this thing recorded so that we can start to address it. A culture of discipline involves duality. People adhere to a consistent system. People are given responsibility within that framework be very valuable to the organization. And I think that's what you'll find by putting non-invasive data governance in place. What it will do is it will get the right people involved, the right people to understand that we don't need to be tyrants about this, that we can do this incrementally within our organization, and that we can move from being good around data governance to being great around data governance. So to summarize real quickly for you, we talked about what's good and what is great, and it really depends on how you define these things within your organization. We talk about good being an enemy of great, and how organizations just settle at being good and don't ever focus on that continuous improvement from yesteryear that they used to talk about all the time. Level five leadership, first the who, then the what, and I shared with you some templates that may have value to you when you take them back to your organization. Cutting the brutal facts and letting your organization know that there's more than one way to do data governance. We don't need to have the command and control hit people ahead with a stick and tell them what to do, we can recognize that there's a list already taking place in our organization, and we can just take advantage of that as we're building our program. And then building that culture of discipline where you take all the, the guesswork out of who does what and when. It's all documented. It's all formal. And so that basically um, wraps up what I'm talk about today. I just, again, wanted to share with you really quickly before we take questions here, um, the, the again, the upcoming 
upcoming webinars, the next one should be real interesting, governing customer data. Is there a difference between customer data and other data? Managing governance met metadata for mass consumption. We'll talk a little bit more detail about some of the things that we talked about today and how do we gather that, that governance metadata and how to make it available to people so it adds value to what they do. We'll talk about big data and small data. We'll talk about building governance expectations. And with that, I, uh, I want to turn it back to Shannon to see if we have any questions regarding the webinar. Stand with us. Sorry, it helps if I unmute myself, so uh, my apologies. Uh, feel free, we have no questions coming in yet, but everyone's really quiet. It must be the heat of the summer. Um, go ahead and enter your questions in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen if you have any. Um, and as Bob says, we have several question. coming up. Yeah. One question for us for James Benedict. Um, as one of roadblocks to go from good data governance to great data governance is vendor lock-in with many organizations. I wanted to know my comment about that. And I guess that uh, that can be true, but it's a, it's kind of a, a hole to fall into. It's a, um, a question of whether or not you are so bought into what the vendor tells you or people in the, the highest part of the organization are so bought into what the vendor tells you that there's really no opportunity for creativity within your organization to devise what you need to. So I would say it could be a roadblock, but at the same time, there's a lot of darn good consultants out there. So even just having these conversations with them about what it would take to move them, move your organization from being a good program to being a great program, um, I think that's one of the things that we can take as a uh, as a value add. Out of, uh, out of that type of situation. A little bit on your non-invasive process. Actually, so when I talk about non-invasive rather than non-evasive, uh, non-invasive is taking the opinion that there's people in your organization already that have some levels of responsibility around the data. And formalize those. So rather than, again, I compare it to the two-by-four approach, where a two-by-four approach is you're going to take a club and you're going to hit people over the head, you're going to give them a new title, you're going to tell them that their role has changed, you make them feel as though you're adding to what they're presently doing rather than formalizing what they're presently doing. So a lot of it really comes from the words that we use when we go into an organization that can be more invasive and about command and control or you can be more focused on getting the right person involved at the right time for the right reason and all of those things that I mentioned before. I mean, so non-invasive is really the approach. The definition of governance, again, going back to what I mentioned earlier, is, is all about the execution and enforcement authority over the management of data, but we don't want to do it in a way that we threaten people within the organization. It doesn't have to be over and above the existing work culture. There's ways that we can formalize, at least to a certain extent, Extent what we're doing now, rather than defining it all as being brand new. My next question is: Have you used a software-based data governance tool? Is one did it all? It's actually a kind of a two-edged sword. So I, I have. I've, I've worked with several tools. One being a, a tool by the name of Calibra, and uh, it's, it's a great data governance tool. Um, AFG has fantastic tools that can be used for governance. Oftentimes, if you're not talking about somebody like Calibra, it's kind of repurposing other tools, metadata tools, uh, workflow management tools, and those types of, of tools to help to enable your governance program. But the ones you see most organizations looking to, and I'm not trying to push one organization or another, would be Calibra, would be ASG. With organizations like that, um, that even the, the, the companies that, that use Irwin um, as a, a tool or Informatica as a tool, these are all excellent tools for enabling any sorts of, of activity within your organization and certainly for capturing the metadata associated with who does what with data in the organization. For note, if we add data guidance tasks to someone's responsibilities, such as data quality, monitoring, and remediation, should we adjust their job description? 
like it really just depends on your organization whether or not you need to change their job description. I mean, if that person's responsibilities were before to, to monitor data quality, to remediate data quality issues, and you're just formalizing it, then no, I don't think it's um, absolutely necessary to go out and, and change their job descriptions. Um, like I said before, one of my pet peeves is that we need that is people thinking they need to go out and change people's titles from whatever their titles are presently to being a data steward. The fact is that they are accountable for what they do with the data, whether or not they're identified as a steward or not. So if they're just using data, then they have some accountability for how they use that data. If they're producing data, they have some level of accountability for how they're producing data. So again, my my suggestion is that we don't change people's job titles. We don't necessarily have to change their um, job descriptions either. We just need to educate them on what it means to do things in a best practice manner. Again, rather than that's why I say we can do it in a non-invasive way rather than an invasive. And that's all the questions we have coming in. I just Bob, thank you again for the another great presentation. Uh, just to remind everyone, we will be posting the recorded webinar and slides to dataversity.net within two business days. And we'll send a follow-up email to let you know the links and other requested information, like the matrices that were presented. Uh, so again, Bob, thank you for this great presentation, and thanks, everyone, for attending. I hope everyone has a great day. Thanks so much. Thank you, Sharon.